Mr. Farid Ajan, the stage is yours. There you go. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, ITA Slovenia, for inviting me to present at this workshop. I think we've got, uh, we'll talk about our tunnel infrastructure. Uh, I'll give you a, a quick uh, overview of uh, our metro and how uh, how we how we how we do maintenance activities so i'll give you an overview of london london underground a brief history of the underground i'll also talk about uh, the managing our tunnels and what we what we do we'll talk about our asset management strategy that can be adopted uh, i'll also then go through some examples of interventions or issues that we've had in our underground tunnels uh, and then we'll talk about uh, potential future practice because, uh, as Arnold said, uh, time moves, technology moves, and we've got to embrace that as well. And then finally, I'll just come to a, a conclusion. So, I'll, uh, the, the underground is over 160 years old. So what we've got is that the first underground line was opened in 1863 and it was part of the uh, Paddington to Farringdon uh, and 160 years later you can see the images which were which were painted uh, and 2023 these are the same assets that are still in operation uh, and providing transport for for London so construction of our tunnels uh, they as you can see, that was from a different area, era using different technologies. We had an opportunities because there wasn't that many, there weren't that many people who were using. So our competitors were members of the public using uh, just walking and also uh, horse-drawn buses, trolley buses, etc. So uh, some of our cut and cover tunnels, which make up about 32 kilometers of our, our, our tunnels, they were literally, they closed the road, uh, excavated, built uh, brick arch tunnels and then covered up again. Uh, but then in the late 1890s, uh, we had, or 1880s, we had uh, the Great Ted Shield. And then we, we, were allowed, we, we managed to actually start constructing deeper tunnels underground, which were smaller. So today's infrastructure, We've got uh, 11 lines, uh, and recently we've had the Elizabeth line, which was Crossrail, although that's not part of London Underground, that's still part of Transport for London's network. Uh, we've got uh, about 402 kilometres of tunnel and 150 kilometres of, of, of underground infrastructure. So this is the tunnel assets at the core of our network. You can see about only out of that 45% of our, our transport for London is underground. So uh, we've got, like we said, 150 kilometers worth of tube tunnels. So when, you, when we've got twin tunnels, we've got about 300 kilometers of twin tunnels. We've got about 800 kilometers of, of, of track. Uh, you've, you can see that it's generally under the centra, center of London where we've got most of our tube, tube network. So, what is it that we do to manage our existing tunnel infrastructure? So, we've got some requirements uh, to ensure that we maintain our operational railway. So, first of all, our requirements, we've got standards. Our standards are uh, setting out what our requirements are. So, primarily, the tunnels need to be safe. We need to, as a maintainer and operator, ensure that the tunnels are safe for members of the public to use and to operate as a railway. Because what we have, what we also do, we're heavily regulated and we have to gain safety certification for the, from the Office of, Office of Rail Regulators. So we also need to meet capacity. So there is growing demand, or there was growing demand for our, to use our network. Uh, Pre-COVID, we were, you know, it was, it was at capacity. The Elizabeth line helped. Uh, we need to make we need to make sure that we're reliable. So again, maintenance forms a key part of 
making sure that our infrastructure is reliable. If we don't invest in maintenance activities, then you will get uh, you'll get delays. You'll get certain sections where the tunnel is uh, the line is suspended because there hasn't been much maintenance activities undertaken. We also need to make sure that it's sustainable, so uh, so uh, so we can we you know our tunnel infrastructure is long lasting. Uh, when we, we also make sure that you know, we consider whole life, so we need to have low whole life costs. So we want to have our tunnels, but we want to have minimum interventions because we're always being pressured in terms of doing more for less. Uh, and finally, we need to be legally compliant because if we're not, we, we've got regulations that we need to comply with. If we're not compliant, then we have to take, do, we have to take the line potentially out of operation. So, I'm saying about 30 years ago, not much was understood in terms of the condition of our tunnel infrastructure. We were just doing reactive maintenance activities, uh, but uh, we didn't know much. So at the advent of the uh, PPP, which is a public-private partnership, uh, we undertook a, an extensive uh, knowledge and inspection program whereby we wanted to understand our infrastructure and what that meant is that we needed to uh, we, we, we undertook inspections so we went and uh, we had a teams undertaking inspections of our tunnel infrastructure that allowed us then to undertake uh, assessments structural assessments of our tunnels to understand what condition that they're in structurally so we've got visual inspections complemented by analysis, which then allowed us to understand from our deep tube tunnel network what the, what the condition of our tunnels really were, and then that will help us plan what maintenance or refurbishment activities were required to keep the tunnels safe. So we've done that now, and today we, uh, we've, we've got a system whereby our maintenance activities also, what we've got is we've got, we inspect periodically, we've got a lot of uh, cast iron tunnels, say 70% of our underground tube, deep tube network are, are cast iron. We're getting more concrete now, we're using sprayed concrete, segmental lining, etc. Uh, so we know from our cast iron tunnel infrastructure that the, uh, the tunnels are fairly stable, they're in very good condition. And therefore, we've taken a risk-based approach. You know, we do inspections of our cast iron once every 12 years, uh, and that's that's appropriate. Uh, other types of linings that we've got are concrete and sprayed concrete to linings, or even expanded cast irons. We or brick linings, we inspect them every four years because we know that we have had we have had more concerns or more signs of defects in those types of linings for maintenance activities. So we've, we've, we have a, a more frequent regular inspection cycle. We also have assessed all the structural capacities of our tunnels. So we, we've, we, we know what their uh, capacity ratios are. Uh, and what all this has allowed us to do is to create a catalog for our assets. So each asset is identified We've given it a, it's identified by a name or a number. Uh, it's, uh, it's then, all its attributes are listed. So in terms of the form of construction, the depth, the geology that the tunnel's in, uh, it also then, from inspections, gives uh, codes, concern codes, concerns of what the last principal inspection uh, had, whether it's from a special inspection regime, all of that would be linked into a uh, asset management system to allow us to maintain our assets. And what, th what that does, it, it, it allows us to recognize what the likely asset behavior will be of our tunnel infrastructure. That will allow us, again, to plan maintenance activities. And that is, again, based on asset risk. So if we, if we, we know all of this information about our infrastructure, that allows us to plan our maintenance activities. And then we use the ALARP principle. We try and keep the risk as low as reasonably practicable. So uh, just there on the, uh, the right-hand side is just a template in terms from our inspections. This is from our standards. What we ask people to do, what our inspectors to do when they go and 
inspect the, the tunnel is to uh, identify the defects. Uh, it could be rusting, corrosion, fractures. Uh, it could be exposed reinforcement, for example. Uh, and it could also be uh, vegetation or previous repairs. What that would, using that information that they've got with, together with photographs, etc., we ask them to then uh, explain, what is it, try and uh, identify what the extent and the severity of these defects are, uh, which will then allow us to plan the maintenance activity, whether we do it immediately, whether we monitor it, or whether we need to do it within the next three to four years. So, uh, so that's, that's how we do our uh, uh, inspections. So at the end of the year, I mean, on a continuous cycle, we have to report the condition of our assets. So that highlights what the concerns are and changes that have occurred throughout the year. So our maintainers are asked to produce a report uh, which lists each and every asset and they will identify where there has been changes, whether it has been an inspection undertaken or whether there's been a real condition, condition concern. So what that allows us to do then is also complement, we have a strict, we have, we, each of our assets has a risk assessment against it. So that allows us, the, with knowing what the behavior of the asset is, so it tells us what the likely asset behaviors are going to be, and then we produce a risk assessment for each of our assets based on asset behaviors, and it tells us what the performance risk will be, so it will tell us in pounds and pence what the risk associated with closing the line will be, or what the safety risk of our infrastructure will be, whether the risk is tolerable or not. So uh, we've got two types, which one which is a strategic risk assessment, which is the general likelihoods that are applied, applied to our assets, and the second one, which is a tactical risk assessment. This is when we've got a specific concern of an asset, we'll do a local risk assessment, and that'll be an asset that'll be assessed individually. So our maintenance philosophy. So we, we, have, a, we have strategic planning, which is a 25 year view. And we also have tactical planning, which is over 12 months, which our regular maintenance activities are undertaken. So with the strategic planning, you're looking at what you need to invest in. So we're looking at monitoring uh, of, of major risks of our assets. So we're looking at the long-term uh, sections of where, uh, using our risk assessment tool, where our, what the past performance of the asset has been. Has it degraded over time? Are there any trends? associated with this particular type of lining or the tunnel in a particular particular geology. Uh, or, 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 and then afterwards, it also helps us identify research and development and other requirements too, to improve performance. So uh, that's the 25 year view. So we may say that if we're not going to do maintenance work, so if we've got all the data, uh, trend modeling, trend analysis from our inspections, we can, then, we can then potentially plan interventions uh, before we, we think that there's going to be a major concern. And secondly, which is the tactical planning, this is just a 12 month view. This allows our maintainers to plan their maintenance activities. So it will be, for example, the delivery of the maintenance, the inspections. So inspections are part of maintenance. So. Uh, they'll have to plan the inspection maintenance and they've got a 12 year rolling program of inspection of our assets on a 12 year or a four year cycle, or even a special inspection regime if there's a specific concern. So that also then allows them to identify specific maintenance tasks on a regular cycle, uh, and then also plan scheduled interventions of our assets based on the output from our inspections. Uh, the other one, which is fault response, this is really reactive maintenance activities. So we have regular patrollers who walk our tunnels and our tracks who are not particularly tunnelers, but they'll see something which is affecting their infrastructure. So they were well, their fixtures and fittings. So they will report that as a fault uh, because it has the risk of actually causing delays and shutting down that section of, of tunnel. So therefore that's done as a fault response and then we've got a period of time whereby uh, the maintenance activities need to be undertaken. So we need to, we, we would want to know that. 
So in terms of maintenance strategies, although this isn't a tunnel and it's a bridge, it's a really good example of the two, main, uh, the two maintenance strategies. So they've got different philosophies here. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a bridge, one which is one operator, which is network rail, and one which is maybe London Underground. So what we've got here is that you've got the left-hand side, you've got uh, preventative maintenance activities. So it's best value, it, painting it regularly, it will keep the bridge last, it will last forever. So these are planned maintenance activities. And the right-hand side is the reactive maintenance activities, so which is more cost-effective if you are struggling for, uh, for, for finance or you've got limited budgets. So uh, let, it, let it corrode, let it degrade a bit, and then we'll do a major overhaul uh, at, a, at a later date. So either is a good strategy, but in this instance, you'd ask the question, you wouldn't want to do it on the same infrastructure. So what are, what are our, yeah, London Underground, what are, what are our maintenance activities? So we have inspections. That is the minimum maintenance activities that we do on our tunnel infrastructure. So that's there to detect and monitor change on, uh, in structure condition. That's reported. Uh, there's a report that's produced by our inspectors. That then gets reviewed by inspection review engineers who will then sign off the inspection uh, and also raise any maintenance work orders, works that need to be undertaken on that asset. So, uh, so, so we have that. The second is preventative maintenance activities. So this is again pre-planned work. So if we know our 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 tunnels and our infrastructure, then we can do the uh, we can we can work we can carry out preventative maintenance situation. We can plan. And the third one is reactive. These are typical like uh, fault planning faults. So if faults are, oh, faults are given, then we have to do, you know, we have to I, what is it, rectify the defects. So ideally, preventative maintenance aids, plans and prevent surprises. However, in many LU tunnels, there is little going on in degradation. So most of the interventions are reactive to particular events. So issues and risk to operation. So we've got loss of serviceability can, cause by, can be caused by various things. It could be by asset degradation, asset abuse, or environmental factors. So asset degradation is that the tunnel degrades over time or, or there's a particular issue that we've got. Asset abuse, which we'll go through, is other parties, third parties, or internal projects doing works which cause damage to our infrastructure and environmental factors with climate change, more frequent trains, that could be a change in the environment. So typical issues that we get, one which is corrosion. In our cast iron tunnels, this is typical. So the rusting might not significantly harm the cast iron tunnel segments, but may spread to other bolts and fixings. So although that the, the, the tunnel lining may seem to be in good condition, the, uh, the, the fixtures and fittings within the tunnel to support other services may have degradation and therefore we need to do some intervention activities. So what, what, what do we do for corrosion? We did a lot of trials in a, in a tunnel environment. So for in a, outside in a bridge, you, in order to repaint a bridge, you need to blast clean it back to bare metal. Uh, in a tunnel environment, that's not appropriate because of the dust and the amount of equipment and plant that's required. So these things need to be thought of. So what we did, we did, we did a number of trials and there is a particular product which we found whereby you don't have to do major cleaning of your tunnel infrastructure and uh, you can apply a rust converter and then apply two coats of another epoxy paint. With all of these materials, they need to be compliant with fire standards because we're in an underground environment. So we've got very strict requirements uh, for, uh, for fire because if a material ignites, it may not cause a major ignition, but you can get toxic fumes potentially in an underground environment and that's not good for us. So we can, we can achieve a similar life to paint that without the needing, need for full cleaning first. So seepage. So here's a seepage that occur periodically. You know, that's typical of our tunnels. All tunnels weep and seep. So small drips relatively, say for example, in the crown of the tunnel or the roof of the tunnel, appear relatively harmless. So if the water runs down the drainage system, there is commonly no issue. And the railway operator, for us as maintenance activity, will go will get no benefit in treating the work. So if there's a if there is a 
path where it can be drained into the drainage system and then, and then managed, not a problem. So we would potentially not do anything and we'll have no intervention there. However, here is that innocent looking drip. Uh, it's falling onto the rail and uh, the electric uh, track circuit system. So that will cause corrosion of the, the rail head, but it will also affect the signaling system which could knock it out. So this defect, although it's small proportion, could cause a fault and so requires urgent rectification. So someone would have to raise, someone would raise a fault when we would likely treat it by sealing some joint, sealing the joint by doing some grouting works or applying a, uh, a concrete uh, plug to divert the water path. Other degradation that could, uh, that, that causes water ingress is slips, trips and hazards. Uh, the ambiance and the uh, uh, of the station for members of the public, it uh, it doesn't look very good. It looks pretty tired, uh, so that's not a good thing. The user perception. Uh, it also ca causes pumping of the track. So if we've got joints open and you've got dynamic loading of of the trains, uh, that could cause material to be pulled into the uh, pulled into the uh, tunnel via the joints. Uh, again, the solution that we found that works and that is uh, very uh, effective is, is grouting, injection grouting. So if you've got low flow, then you could use uh, acrylic grouting uh, or you could, if it's fast flow, you could use some form of polyurethane grouting. But all of that needs to be, needs to be designed. Uh, acid degradation is, a, is, a, is another problem that we have with clay loading over time. So here we've got, uh, we've got a cross passage uh, and there's the general view. It's, not, it's, not, it's typical of our infrastructure in terms of what we see as a cross passage. But as you take a closer look, as you go on the right of the picture, you can, you can see that you've got deformation. So this is result of clay loading over time. So once you've created your underground space, the, the, the load from the ground doesn't, what we've found from our clay, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't, you don't get the full 100% loading immediately. That happens over a number of years. So this was probably built in the 1890s, 1900s, this section of tunnel. Uh, but over time, when the clay loading has, has come onto the tunnel lining, uh, what we've now got is some deformation of the, uh, of the tunnel. Uh, uh, lintels over opening. So what we find is uh, where you've got openings to passageways and we've got these undersized lintels. So even from our assessments, it's shown that it's non-compliant with standards. Uh, we've, uh, we, we, we have got this. Just, just very quickly on this one, the, the thing that we've done over here is that we've, we, you, can, you can monitor it. You don't potentially have to uh, do any maintenance, do any activities, intervention works. So what we're doing here is monitoring the, uh, the tunnel. So we've got real-time monitoring installed uh, and that's also supplemented by special inspections where our, our inspectors will go and report on the condition of the tunnel. Because what we've seen is that this, it's not, uh, the telltale signs are, this has happened. Uh, it's not, it's not, it's not continuing. The other thing that we get is a particular area of geology in our infrastructure could cause, uh, sand, has got sand lenses. And uh, after 40 years of dry weather, dry years, water ingress started suddenly. So we don't know, we don't understand why. We think that there was, doing some site investigations, that there was a sand lens within the area, which is water bearing. And then the flow of water started coming in. but more worrying was that we had sand lenses and sand coming into our into our tunnels. Now the problem here becomes is the stability of the tunnel because if material is coming in there's a void being created somewhere else uh, in our tunnel. So this was um, could cause operational problems because the sand accumulates and the trains have got to go through it and it could cause uh, signaling, signaling failures uh, and then also structural concerns. So what did we do? So the solution here is, again, we, we, we had to design a system whereby we can 
we can stop the water and the sand from coming in. So again, we seal the joints using acrylic grouts. And in some locations where we had really fast acting water, as you saw there, we would have to inject uh, a polyurethane. Uh, we had to try and fill the void that was created behind the lining. Uh, there, what we did is we had to do uh, simple things, hammer tap testing to see whether there's a hollow sound behind the tunnel lining, or, or we, uh, we open the, uh, the grout plugs and uh, you can use a, a, a rebar to poke a hole or a camera through there to see where the voids were. That helped us then map where we thought the voids were and we did some cementitious uh, bulk uh, void filling behind the tunnel lining. That also helps create a seal behind the tunnel. Uh, temporarily, because there was another work, other works were going on as part of station infrastructure, uh, there was temporary dewatering uh, undertaken. That helped us because that lowered the water table that allowed us to do the joint sealing as well as the, the void filling. And we undertook some monitoring. So we monitored this tunnel, uh, not necessarily real-time monitoring, but on a weekly uh, manual survey. So targets were installed at uh, regular intervals and regu regular, uh, regular rings and around the ring to help us see whether there was a change in shape for the, uh, for, for, of, of, of the tunnel. So again, we, 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 we talk about grouting. The, other, the, the thing about grouting now, we've, got, we've learnt a lot from grouting activities and injection grouting. So what we say now is previously our maintainers would send a, main, the, a maintenance contractor out there, go and seal that seepage uh, without any thought given to the impact that this, uh, their work would potentially have on the safety of the operational railway. Now, we have had an instance whereby we've injected grout between two, two linings and that's caused defamation, which has actually, when the first or second train passed through, uh, it scraped the uh, the, the 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 train, which meant we had loss of service for the for the whole whole day. So we learnt a lot. So we've got a, a guidance document that we've created from the lessons learnt, uh, which uh, which specifies that grouting needs to be a designed solution. So it fo it forces uh, grouting specialists or maintainers to think or consultants to think about the hazards associated with grouting to the operational railway. What we find is that. Contractors are very good at looking at the risks associated with slips, trips and falls, working at heights, for example, but they didn't think about the hazards and the risks associated with the op uh, effect of what they're doing on the operational railway. So, uh, so that's now better understood. So you choose the approach material, you do it in a controlled way, you produce a design, and there's just a typical example of one that we designed. There was a passageway that was full of water and sand that was coming in. Uh, we, we, we completed a design for, for to doing some grouting works. And what we found there is the, uh, the after the event, you can see that the, that tunnel is pretty dry. Uh, we, did a, we did a site visit probably a, a, about three months ago and uh, the tunnel is, in, is still dry and uh, the, the, the grouting solution worked very well. There's another thing that we have in terms of uh, acid degradation. We've got acidic groundwater. Now, this is a particular problem that's in the Lambeth group of our, our geology. So in the presence of air and water, a reaction occurs with, uh, which generates sulfuric acid. Uh, the acid can attack the concrete and it also can attack the uh, metallic linings uh, of, our, of our infrastructure, but also the fixtures and fittings within the tunnels. So that, that uh, is a problem, it's a similar problem that we know within our industry. So uh, what we've, there, there, there were two things. There was one in the 1990s where the tunnel linings had cracked and we had to do a complete rebuild of that section of tunnel that was using stainless steel lining. But as Arnold, as you said, is that technology moves on, you get clever, you can do more for less. So here, we, we, we thought more about it. So we've got pyrites, which is a naturally natural in the soil. We've got air from the tunnel because we've got open joints and we've got water from the ground. So this is something that naturally is. So to stop the production of the, the acid, 
we need to, if we, if we eliminate one of the three, then the reaction will no longer occur. So our solution was to seal the joints of the tunnel lining using an acrylic kraut. There was a system whereby we had a modified bolt, so we'd remove the existing bolts of the lining, and through this modified bolt, you can inject some acrylic kraut. Uh, once, you've, once you've stopped that, uh, once you've sealed the joints, you stop the reaction, uh, and then you can monitor it. So you don't have to do the ref uh, what is it? The, uh, the major build or the major refurbishment works uh, to which would be costly and probably unnecessary. Uh, we've done this, 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 this does work, it has worked very well. So the other thing is asset abuse now, uh, which is other people doing uh, works to our tunnel linings. So the one on the right hand side was a train uh, which uh, when the rail broke, I think it derailed and that knocked out a number of the flanges of the uh, tunnel lining, uh, but the tunnel remained static. Uh, we, we, again, the solution here was to uh, try and re-establish the uh, load path in the ring and we infilled it with reinforced concrete uh, and that re-established the hoop, the load in the lining uh, and that worked very well. The, the one on the right hand side, as you can see, is uh, flanges that were ground, uh, which, were, which, were, which were ground back for clearances. So we had new train stock that came in. So uh, believe it or not, I'm not sure whether the full analysis was done, whether the train fits the tunnel. It was the other way they asked us, well, why doesn't your tunnel fit? the trout size of the train. And we said, well, which was there first? So uh, in this instance, uh, back in the 90s, uh, they decided that they will grind the flanges to get the re required clearances. And as you can see here is they've ground it back so far that they've exposed the uh, tunnel bolts. The worst thing about this particular location that they didn't get the, the area correct, so they ground the wrong rings. So <laughs> that's asset abuse. The other asset abuse that you will get is piling work. So developers on the surface also would like to uh, carry out some uh, major developments, major, major works in and around our infrastructure. Uh, if they don't set it out right, so this is found for foundation. So if they don't set it out right, they will get, they, and uh, in, in relation to our tunnel infrastructure, and that's not checked, you can get penetration of the tunnel that could be catastrophic. So here's an example of something on a, uh, in a tunnel whereby you can see the, uh, the, uh, some of the bits from the uh, coring that have was caught through the hole of the tunnel lining from the, uh, from the borehole sinking and then, dip, and then landed in the path of an operating railway line, which, uh, which causes, and then it could cause derailment. So again, we said London uh, is ever-changing, it's growing, there's a lot more development, demolishing of existing inf uh, uh, buildings, building new uh, structures, bigger, deeper, uh, that's going on. Uh, but we've got also our 400 kilometres of, uh, 150, 300 kilometres of our tunnels underground uh, and also other services. So. So another form of asset abuse is, infrastructure, uh, is we need to protect our infrastructure from the impacts of uh, these developers uh, on, our, on our tunnels. And uh, it's not just developers, it's also within ourselves for station upgrades, for example, or building in and around our existing infrastructure. So that will cause defamation because our tunnels are probably about 20, 30, 40 meters below ground level. So they will have surface settlements, but also subsurface settlement uh, with, with, with the clay. Uh, we, we ask everybody, anyone who wants to do that, even whether it's an internal project or an outside party, to do an analytical assessment of, our, of the impact, to tell us what the impact of their works are going to be on our infrastructure. Uh, that's a very, uh, that's an iterative process. We've written it into our, into our standards and requirements in terms of how they should do it. It's a well-established process. Uh, 
to to do they will then sit down with us we will then help set what the mitigation measures are for that some of them may need to have some physical intervention and mitigation measures before they do any of the works others and most likely is that they will have some form of monitoring to be undertaken either manual monitoring or automated real-time near real-time monitoring system uh, however when they are doing this work we would always ask them to produce a monitoring action plan or an emergency preparedness plan because what we want to know is at what point do we need to carry out intervention works or at what point is our structure under stress or the operation of the railway could be under stress so it may not be that the structure uh, is is under distress however our tunnels are plastered paint finishes tiling etc so any movement could have an impact where you can get falling elements you can get tiles dropping or you can get pieces of the plaster or, 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 or finishes falling so those are critical things that we ask them to look at so we ask them as well as structural what's the serviceability impacts on our infrastructure in our stations for example uh, typically like we said there's a typical system here where we've got monitoring targets around the tunnel uh, which which they will do we then set trigger levels so these trigger levels will either be uh, something like uh, green amber red and then black everything that is green or below green you're good to go uh, where you've got amber is we're reaching a threshold that we've set with them which gives us advanced warning that there's something going on uh, red is typically well this is the, the the tunnel isn't behaving as we had predicted so even before we before any structural concern uh, we would then actually have a controlled stop procedure and a plan of call call engineering uh, an engineering meeting to actually look at what what needs to be done next and then a black is a full emergency response where we just need to stop and we will make that decision we will tell them you need to stop based on the information the developer provides us with us so we would probably have daily meetings with them where they'll provide and share the monitoring data and the trends and see how things are behaving uh, so then we can be assured that the railway is operating safely so here's another example again this isn't typical that we have this every day but this is something that we've had to do so this is a particular type of lining is uh, an expanded lining now with an expanded lining it's susceptible to changes in environment we've got we've got more frequent trains because the demand has increased we've got heavier and newer trains coming into the tunnels now these particular type of lining was built in the 1960s 1970s and the perception here with the expanded lining was is that how can we do things quicker and how can we do things cheaper and one of the things that was considered and that was installed is that if you've got good competent clay uh, you can jack the lining against the ground therefore it will attract load uh, so it started acting in uh, in hoop in compression and therefore because you then do not have an annulus between the tunnel and the ground you don't have to grout you don't have to fill the void with a cementitious material that made things quicker and cheaper so over the years like we said we've got new trains we've got new infrastructure what's what's done what we saw then is combined with poor build we with 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 the, with the heat generated from more frequent trains what we've got is that the joints are open because they were never designed to be grouted so the heat migrated behind the tunnel and you, you it shrunk the clay back from behind the tunnel which then meant is that we lost support from the ground and with the bad build we only this particular lining had a, a only a small contact area so we started getting failure of the uh, we get a spalling of the tunnel so temporarily uh, we 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 installed some straps uh, to make sure that the railway is always not at risk so from from catastrophic failure uh, but eventually we knew that we had to do some intervention these temporary straps allowed us more time to think and design on what needs to be done so here is we designed a bespoke uh, working platform 
to allow us to uh, undertake our, 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 our works, which was, was, as you can see, in the centre with a segment erector. This was on a works, uh, works train wagon that came in every day uh, and uh, in and out. Uh, that we did, we did extensive trials in an area of the tunnel that wasn't operational to see whether it would be successful, uh, which we proved that, yes, you can replace it. Uh, and then on a nightly basis in engineering hours, we undertook uh, over a window of about three or four hours every day, we carried out maintenance activities, which allowed us to rebuild probably about a three, 400 meter section of our tunnels without uh, disturbance of an op of the operational railway. The only thing that we did is that we took advantage of some possessions, and that would took a lot of planning for, uh, in short, to close the railway line and that particular section. But that was done, and that was successfully completed. So we changed it from uh, concrete linings to uh, SGI linings. But maintenance activities, as we said, uh, tunnel maintenance is carried out in engineering hours. And we have, we have a lot of logistical problems which we really do need to think about. Uh, and you'd need to have a very robust system to make sure that the works can be carried out safely. You can then hand back the track to, uh, to operation so then they can start the service in the morning. So typically you'll have temporary works, you'll have temporary lighting, overhead works, uh, manual labor that's uh, required so you need to have a safe system in place to allow network so we have a system in place whereby you need to book a central system whereby you need to book access for that particular area so everyone can then see where all the works are being carried out on the on the on the network on whether there are two parties or three parties carrying out works in that area and whether they require exclusive access or not uh, you also now need to book into the station. So if your party comes, they have to have one lead person who will book the whole group to make sure that, uh, and that everyone has to sign. They have to undergo training to, uh, to, to be allowed to work on our track because uh, it's, it's in an underground environment. It's not, it's not usual. Uh, they will book in with the station. You'll have a protection master as well because the protection master will make sure that the electricity that we, the system that we've got is switched off, uh, so it's safe for people to work on track. Then you will allow people to enter the, the, the workspace, carry out their work. Everyone then has to sign out to make sure that, to make sure that everyone is off the track, uh, and then you can start operation. If there is a situation whereby you find that they haven't signed out, then you can't start operation of the railway until they have resolved that problem and they found the person or the group that haven't signed out. So future, now looking, looking at the future, what, what, what can we do? So we need to develop our skills. We've got the advent of uh, computers, digital. So we need to start using it for helpful information. So we, we can use a better use of BIM and uh, GIS, which we call Geographical Information System, to help us uh, plan our new tunneling activities uh, to understand how they interact with the existing, for example. Uh, so that will help uh, allow design, but also allow help the, uh, the maintenance strategy for our infrastructure. Then you've got, again, AI, and you've got uh, machine learning. Here I mean machine learning, whereby you, what you could have is is uh, a, a system whereby the you can you can teach the computer or the program to find faults and to help us rectify those or identify that potentially if you don't do so if you don't do something in year five then you'll have a bigger problem. Uh, so what we're looking at at the moment and is developing is automating our inspections uh, so we can reduce what we can do is reduce the inspector who's a specialist from going around the tunnel so and just looking at things that we're not so concerned about but it can focus they can focus on areas where there is a potential problem so uh, so i mean this is really driven by also we've got we've got less and less maintenance uh, periods whereby we can work we've got over the weekends now we've got a 24-hour tube so people can only work from sunday night 
through to Thursday night and more and more people want to work on our network. So you've got limited time. So this is a good way forward. This is a trial that you can use a multiple use of it. You can also use it to check gauging and clearances as well. The other thing that we can do is look at, uh, look at technology with cap, uh, cloud point scans. You know, these are really good uh, images that you can now get uh, and you can potentially use this with CAD uh, to develop a, a, a catalog for the uh, for the 21st century again these are things that are all in development these are the things that we we would think about so we've got here now on the right hand side was a cloud point scan using cad we've mapped the tunnel and there on the right hand side is is the actual uh ticket hall that you can see so if we can have a virtual fly through uh it could have many uses for our infrastructure uh, operator so in conclusion, I would say that our tunnels asset base is, is aged, but they're safe and reliable and performing well. From our inspection and assessments program that we have and our main, you know, it's, it's assets are maintained and managed as low reason, reasonably practicable. Uh, improving the asset knowledge helped us create a risk-based uh, management system to improve the reliability of the assets. But nonetheless, the asset is not static and some interventions are needed. The demand and capacity and reliability is growing. So what we're saying also is technology must continue to contribute to the maintenance uh, of an effective and efficient system and service. So finally, I'll leave you with a photo of the oldest deep tube tunnel, which is at Stockwell. Uh, this is a terminus. This was the terminus for the first deep tube tunnel railway, uh, opened in November 1890. Although it's not used as a platform tunnel, it's a crossover tunnel, uh, but it's still giving us reliable service. So, uh, thank you. That's uh, my presentation. Thank you. Um, it's I just want to thank you for the chat. So now we have uh, roughly 10, 15 minutes or so for the Q&A for interaction. So your questions, comments, concerns uh, in Slido, uh, we don't have any. Uh, we've had a couple of tests, you know, is it working? It is. So um, throughout the presentations, also the, the following three ones, uh, if you have something, just write it in Slido and then I'll uh, pick it up uh, at the end. So we'll fall back onto the analog part. So we have uh, the mic here. So. We already have a question here and then another there. Great, great presentation. Um, my name's Arnold. <laughs> um, HS2 is in the press, loss of confidence, funding from government. What you've just described obviously requires a lot of funding. Any strategies you can share with us on how you keep the money you need to keep this sort of, you know, program running? Because it's, uh, this is hard, I would have thought, to, to keep the money. Yeah. This is where we're, where we're getting every year. We do get uh, the maintainers coming to us and saying, you need to make savings every year. It, it happens. So uh, we have got, like we said, we've got our risk assessments for e all of our assets. So all of our assets has got a risk assessment in terms of its uh, safety risk and also its performance and what impact on performance it will have. Uh, together with the inspections, uh, we can then present a case whereby you may want to do something uh, and inspections are saying that, can we do something now? We'll then do a local risk assessment and say, well, if you, if you don't do it, these are the consequences of what will happen. Or we can then make an informed decision and say, well, you, don't, you may defer it for another year or two, however, you're going to have to do that. So we're always playing that, that reviewing. It's quite a live system. So if you understand the risk that your asset poses its condition, that can then help you identify uh, where savings can potentially be made on, 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 on maintenance activities. Uh, although we, we, we don't want to reduce our maintenance costs because what we find is that it's one of the first things that always gets cut once it's operating. Oh, you don't need to maintain it. It's there. Your tunnels are fine. I mean, sometimes 
I think our engineering, we're our, we're our own worst enemies because our tunnels, like I've, I've said, are 160 plus years old and they are performing really, really well. So it's a very slow moving infrastructure. It doesn't degrade that much over time. The biggest cost that we have is seepage control, water ingress, and uh, the biggest risk to our railway is asset abuse, third party developers. Uh, in and around our infrastructure. So uh, in terms of maintenance, when we look at the other disciplines like uh, bridges and structures, uh, our maintenance budget is probably not as big. Uh, but yeah, if we have the risk and the knowledge of our assets, you can then make an informed judgment in terms of whether maintenance needs to be done immediately or whether it can be, it can be done later on. Now we've just gone through a program where where they've done an assessment, uh, they've come to us and we're saying, well, if you're going to cut the budget, do minimum, this is what the impact will be. But maybe in 25 years time, because we have seen a major refurbishment or intervention required, you must budget for an intervention required, a major intervention there. However, if you do your intervention at a lesser scale here to keep up the regular maintenance activities, then you possibly won't get the bigger spend further down the road. Hope that answers your question. All right, we have another question. Federico, I believe, in the second row. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Farid. Uh, was really interesting uh, presentation. You really show all the process from the beginning uh, until the end from the uh, also all the point, main point from the authority point of view is, was really interesting. Uh, my question is regarding uh, uh, the asset management system. Uh, so you showed really a lot of work here, uh, the monitoring part, the inspection part, uh, data collection part, uh, uh, survey and so on. So uh, the first part of the question is uh, now, uh, if you can further elaborate on now, how is this asset management system for the uh, IT infrastructure, engineering infrastructure point of view to manage all this data and support decision at the end. And uh, regarding the future perspective, uh, this problem of big data that probably you already have uh, will be much larger. So how is your strategy of implementing these technologies going forward to tackle this technology inside the system? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so in terms of now, we have an asset management uh, database system uh, which we call, which we've called Ellipse, or or what we moved into just very very recently is, is Maximo. Uh, that that's manually inputs all the data, so the inspectors that will help us understand. So all of that has got all of the attributes of the tunnel. So each tunnel, as I said, it's got a name associated with it, its attributes in terms of its geology, its depth, its last inspection condition. Uh, and then you would have to go through all of that and then also a history of what works uh, intervention works were carried out so it's it's it works uh, for our, for our tunnel infrastructure we are slowly moving into something whereby you can try and automate etc but that's that's a working work in progress but the the system is it's, it's on a database I guess it's it's manually imports it's checked uh, they use that information to plan our inspection cycles and then also input into their uh, work orders that need to be carried out on the asset. It will list, for example, it needs to be carried out within the year, within the next five years, within the five, ten years, or whether you just need to monitor until the next principal inspection cycle. Uh, going forward, yes, big data is is something that we've got to uh, work work with and get a get control of uh, my, my my view is that you can collect a lot of data but it needs to be useful uh, we, we we do collect a lot of data and you're thinking well what are we going to do with this uh, we're working with our tech and data team because uh, they are going to be leading leading our leading our uh, development in terms of storage so again you know previously everything used to be held on hard drives uh, even the sticks now, everything's in the cloud. So you can see it's starting to move. Security of our data is really important. So that's why we're quite a closed and 
closed system, whatever we have in terms of our 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 data. But again, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I'm not too clear on what tech and data and our maintainers is doing for 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 implementing all of this information. But we are working with them closely to try and influence in terms of how they or what we require, and then and then they can develop the system for us. Okay, thank you. And uh, in a few moments, I will show some example. <laughs> okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, Federico is next. I mean, there's going to be a coffee break, but yeah, then he's yeah, next yeah. on stage. He's going to continue. If there is no other people, I want to ask another question. If there is, because I don't say you raise hands. Please do. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's, okay. It's to you. Um, um, I cannot agree more on what you showed about um, uh, the inspection phase, uh, the analysis phase, and the connection with decision making phase. Uh, the whole process it's uh, it's I, I think it's it's the right way right way to do it, and you do it really well. Uh, I saw a lot here as a, a qualitative risk analysis approach. I want to know if you are planning uh, to uh, I don't know maybe for the most critical uh, tunnels, for instance, if you are planning also to uh, perform a quantitative risk analysis to link them directly, for instance, with the uh, cost and life loss, for instance, for the analysis in the decision making phase. So, so, so we can tell you now. I mean, with our risk assessments, we can we we would say the central section of our tunnels under the city are. Uh, Safety, when we do the analysis, the, compared to the performance risk in terms of loss of service, uh, that, that you'll always find is up there, you know, in its millions. Because you can imagine if you, send, if you close the central section of a railway line, then you've got loss of revenue. Uh, safety, we normally find is that when we do the safety, you look at the uh, likely asset behaviours, who is going to be the most exposed individuals uh, in your risk assessment, you'll, and then you do the assessment in terms of tolerability, you'll find that the safety risk is relatively low in our tunnels, but the consequences are really high. Uh, so so, that, so, so you'll, 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 that's, that's what you'll find with regards to our infrastructure. So we have done quantified risk assessments of all our tunnels, uh, which which is then complemented by our physical inspection regime uh, in terms of telling us how they have changed. So if we've if we've got a particular issue within one of our tunnels, uh, which is causing us a concern, we will do a specific risk assessment that gets fed into the uh, the main assessment that we've got the the main. Uh, database for all of our infrastructures. What we can then do is that we can interrogate the, our risk assessment tool to identify the, for example, what are the top 10 risks associated with deep tube tunnels? How has that changed? Has that changed? That can then help us say, well, why has that changed? We can then start asking the questions, drill down in more detail, and then determine whether an actual intervention is required or whether that risk is tolerable. So you have everything database also from this point of view? Yes, yes, at the moment we've got it on the database. Okay. okay, thank you. All right, Angelo, um, there's a... Uh, you, thank you for this great presentation, an interesting one. Uh, so I have two questions. Uh, what are typical uh, maintenance inspect inspection periods uh, when you go through one part of a, of a tunnel? Is, is this one week, one month, one year, or these four years what you were so, uh, so we, before. so sure. With, with, with our with our tunnels, what we've found from our knowledge and inspection program, and historical, uh, our our knowledge uh, as well of the infrastructure for cast iron tunnels, they're very stable. So based on that, we've determined that the minimum, as as a minimum, you need to carry out an inspection, a visual inspection, a principal inspection of the structure once every 12 years, uh, because our cast iron tunnels are very stable. Uh, what that also allows is an inspector or an engineer through his career, we may be at London Underground, uh, over a 30 or 40 year career, to have seen the asset at least th two or three times. Uh, so again, that's risk-based. 
uh, that's based on our knowledge. However, if there is a particular concern with a section of tunnel, we can then make a judgment in terms of whether a special inspection is required. So we may say at openings in cast iron tunnel linings, if we know a problem, you need to inspect, go and do a special inspection of that opening, report on the condition of that particular opening once every six years. Or we may say, well, the monitoring system has gone down at this location, you need to go in once a week. So we, we do use a risk-based approach in terms of our, our approach tunnels. What we found is our newer constructed tunnels using concrete uh, materials uh, or expanded uh, linings with no bolts. We've, ha we've had more problems and defects found on those, th that infrastructure and therefore we have determined that those will be inspected every four years. Uh, and that's basically because we found more concerns with them and four years within four years you sh you know you may be able to you probably be able to see change but you've also got to look at we've got other people who patrol our tunnels uh, to have a look at the track and more often than not if a fault is raised if a concern is raised they they will raise it within our running tunnels and within a station although some of our stations are clad you're also likely to get one of the station operators station staff who have seen a problem with seepage because someone's had a slip, trip or fall or they've seen drops, they will also report it as a fault. So sometimes you've got to think, right, OK, who's likely to see this first, you know, uh, in terms of a problem that we'll, we can then deal with. But a structural detailed inspections, we've got two periods, once every 12 years, once every four years, and then we can then have special inspections based on each specific location on their own. I think you have another question. Does uh, London Underground give then kind of uh, approvals or uh, consents to the third users which are above in the, in the process of the building permit? Uh, yes. So we've got, a, we've got an infrastructure protection team uh, who engages with third parties uh, to protect our assets. We've written standards. Uh, so what normally happens with third parties is they need to put a planning application through to the local boroughs. Uh, the local boroughs have an agreement with uh, London Underground TfL that uh, any new developments in and around our infrastructure, they will, they will inform us and we will also check. We've also got uh, uh, surface patrollers uh, along the line and they will also ride the line every day. That's the legal requirement. Uh, so to check for any any third parties doing any works that we're, we're unsure of. So we will catch it. We will then engage with them. Uh, so, for example, to understand what works they're planning to do, whether they're looking to do heavy piling, heavy basements, if it's going to be a demolition and multi-storey construction, for example. So they'll have to undertake an impact, an assessment to understand the impact of their tunnel, their works or their development on our existing infrastructure. And normally, as you saw in one of the slides, you get the tunnels where you've got an excavation tend to move towards where you've got the excavation because the ground has relaxed. So they'll try and move in that direction. We will then, they will then work with us. We'll review their reports, say whether it's a structural problem, whether it's the serviceability, what is the critical element, whether it's the track and the clearances, because that's what's normally the uh, one of the critical issues. and we will then set, like we said, limits. We'll work with them in terms of what they, but they have to get approval from us uh, before they go ahead. All right, thank you very much. The time's up, so thank you very much, uh, Farid Acham. <laughs>